I want to turn your attention now to, again to the word of the Lord. Chapter 19 here in the book of Revelation. We'll pick up in verse 11 through verse 21 tonight. That event that I don't know about you, I'm looking forward to. The second coming of the Lord. Amen. Amen. One day our Savior is going to poke his head through the clouds. And he's going to ride right on back down here and take care of business. Amen. And it's, I don't know it's going to be too much longer either. You know, we've got a few things that are going to happen before the Lord returns and as we return with him. But it's one of those amazing events that now as we draw near the end of this amazing book here, the book of Revelation, the apocalypse, the unveiling, uh, that we as the church are just absolutely longing for. Because we look at our world, and, and this week has been one of those weeks to where we're just going, God, how long are you going to wait? What, what, else, you know, what else needs to happen? Does a world war need to break out? Do we, you know, do we need to see more innocent people slaughtered? We're going to be having over the next several weeks all kinds of special things going on, so I encourage you to be here for those. This coming Sunday we'll have... A dear couple that I've known for a long time, Jesse and Mallory Woodhall, will be here and they're going to be sharing with us what they do uh, to smuggle Bibles into China. And so they'll be sharing with us on Sunday about the persecuted church in China. And, and as we sit here tonight, we're all safe and cuddly and cozy and warm and filled with technology. And I was sharing with the pastor's class on Wednesday. You know, I, I didn't really think about it too much, but... You know, you guys can pretty much fact check me on the fly. You can pull out your smartphone. He just said, what? <laughs> That's how fast technology is, is moving. And our world is moving in a clip that's like that. And it's moving towards evil in a way that we've never seen before. The number of people that are, that are bent towards Destruction and self-destruction is monumental. And one day, uh, the Lord's going to end all of it. He's going to say enough, and he's going to come. And he's going to finish that work of destroying sin once and for all. Before that, we have some life to live. We have some gospel to preach. And so before we dig in, let's ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, we are again so grateful for the blessing of being able to be here and even read your word. Lord, that we have Bibles is amazing. So much of the world doesn't. Lord, we have so many other things, this wonderful facility and all of the staff that makes these things happen. Lord, as we gather together, these tremendous musicians that have led us in, in worship. Lord, all of your blessings that are so many and buried, we couldn't count them. If we named them, Lord, we counted them one by one. Surely we'd run out of breath. And so, God, we ask that you bless us with your presence, instruct us by your spirit through these words which you authored, Lord, nearly 2,000 years ago that are so close to coming true, Lord, so close to being the reality that the world will see. We ask that you would bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 11, and it says, And now I saw in heaven that it opened. And behold, a white horse, and he who judges sat on him, was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. And it, it seems almost contradictory when you think about righteousness and war, but there is such a thing as righteous war. When mankind leaves God no choice, then the Lord himself will resort to what he does not want to do. God very clearly stated in the Psalms that he does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked, but he in fact will cause that to come to pass eventually when wickedness reaches its apex, when it has gotten to its peak, when it has risen to a level to where the world will no longer return from it. In other words, there's really no repentance left in the heart of man. And in righteousness he judges and makes war, and his eyes are like the flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no one except himself knew. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, 
and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. As this passage unfolds before us, it's a heavenly scene. And it begins in heaven, descends to earth. And so it's important to keep that in mind as we move forward tonight. Last week we saw the marriage supper of the Lamb. And as I shared with you then, there will be two suppers. And the choice is yours as to which one you attend. You can either attend the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven, or you can be the food at the banquet for the birds that will be here on earth. There will be a banquet, and we'll see that as we finish up tonight. It'll be here, and it won't be good. It'll be the one that you don't want to be at. And as Jesus speaks of this event himself, he, he's spoken of it several times. It's actually recorded uh, also in the Gospels in Matthew 24 and Luke 21. If you want to turn to Matthew 24, verse 30, we'll look at that next. But the second coming of the Lord, as he comes, he's not coming back. Remember, he came the first time in, in his first advent, his, his his descent from heaven to earth the first time, he came as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And it was then that he was the Lamb that was slain. He came in humility. He, he counted his own life not dear. He, he died a death that no one should die. And he died that death for you. He died that death for me to anyone who will believe. He came the first time in total meekness and humility as a lamb slain. But the second time he's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's coming back as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is coming back as the almighty and omnipotent one. He's not coming back again to reinstill some other plan of grace. He's coming back. Grace will have run all the way to the end of mankind's acceptance of it, and repentance will have disappeared from the vocabulary of mankind. And so when Jesus comes again to this earth, remember that several things have happened. The church has been raptured away. The church is in heaven. The tribulation saints have been martyred. They're also in heaven. The 144,000 which receive Christ and then miraculously are protected by the Lord are still on the earth, but they're saved. There will be people here who are going to be rebelling still. With all of that having gone on, mankind will still refuse to turn. And it shows you the hardness, the capacity for hardness of men's hearts. Man's heart. What happened this week in Orlando shows you the capacity that mankind has to have a hardened heart. How could anyone possibly think that somehow they were serving a God, not the God, a God, and, and innocently slaughter 50 people, wound another 50? How, could that, how does that even happen? How could a whole people be so deceived as to engage in the Holocaust? Mankind has a tremendous capacity for evil. Here's the scary part. It has not reached its apex. It will get worse. That's an absolute fact. That's what your Bible says, and it's never been wrong. The hearts of man will wax worse and worse until there is no remedy save the lion of the tribe of Judah coming back and defeating sin himself. So people sit around and they, they ponder, well, I think we're going to turn the corner and things are going to be fine. Now, that may be true temporarily. But I can tell you this, the story's already written. The history book is before you in your laps. And it says what's going to happen in the last days is it's going to get infinitely worse than it's ever been. Because in it, as we've seen described from chapter 6 to chapter 19, are events that have never occurred in the history of mankind. And so if God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Jesus is coming again. 
Matthew 24, verse 30, and at that time, speaking of the second coming, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all of the nations of the earth will mourn. All of the nations of the earth will mourn. And they will see, and notice this, please underline it, they will see. And the the phrase used there, the words used there, indicates a visible appearance that simultaneously the entire world Every person on the planet, all of the nations of the earth, will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky. Undoubtedly a reference, I believe, to not only the Shekinah glory of God coming with Jesus himself, but the heavenly hosts descending from heaven. With power and with great glory... And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet to call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one of the ends of the heaven to the other. In other words, it's going to be a cataclysmic event, and it's going to be called to order by Jesus himself, and the glory of God will descend to the earth. Matthew records it, Luke records it, and it goes on from there. And notice where the angels are gathering the elect from, from heaven not from earth. In other words, they're going to gather together those who are God's elect. They've already been saved. They've been redeemed. They've been in heaven. Tonight, we see God make good on that promise. You know, people debate the second coming of the Lord, and I I really, I I feel sorry for them in, in some way because nothing sucks the life out of the church like a dismissal of the imminent return of the Lord. Because ultimately, if Christ is not coming back, then there's no urgency. If Christ is not coming back, then you can dilly-dally all you want for the rest of your life. But if in fact the Lord is returning, and if in fact what will precede that is the rapture of the church, then the church needs to get busy with the gospel message. Because one day, the time that we have to share that message is going to end. You're not going to get another chance to go talk to your parent. You're not going to get another chance to present Christ to your family. You will not get another chance at work. You, you, because you know the Lord, you're going to be home. But for them, it's going to be a drastic situation that ensues because they are going to be under the reign of the Antichrist for seven years, and then the Lord's coming back and the age of grace is over. So the doctrine of the second coming of the Lord is extremely important to us as believers. It's the fire that should be burning in your belly. It it should cause you to recognize you don't have your entire life to live as you please. God's left you here for a purpose, left us here for a purpose, has planted this church in the South Bay for a purpose, and that purpose is to win people to Jesus Christ before it's too late. It should be the fire in our souls. It's a real event. It's not not like watching a movie. I will tell you, I'm, I'm not against all movies. And it's interesting to me how many people are so concerned with, you know, the next movie in the Star Wars trilogy when they don't recognize the truth of the next movement of the Spirit in God's plan for mankind. Our time could be short. Iran just announced today, and this is the crazy thing about the election cycle that we're in. You, I mean, if you've missed some of the idiotic things that one of the candidates has been saying, whose name begins with T, <laughs> that he's planning on you know, taking away the negotiations that happened with Iran, and Iran announced today that if he does that, they will launch a missile attack on Israel. Now, I don't know about you, but Israel's not going to put up with that. And they have the technology to make sure that Iran looks like a very level place, like a parking lot. (laughs) And then the rest of the Arab nations aren't going to take too kindly that, and neither is their arms supplier, Russia. And so read Ezekiel 38 and 39 and ask yourself some simple questions. 
Could not a simple presidential election bring about the things that none of us want to have happen, but your Bible says will? I'm not being a prophet of doom. I'm just telling you, people are talking the kind of craziness that everybody said would never happen, and yet sets before us tonight. The things that we've been studying since chapter 6. little story of a pastor named L.T. Talbot. And he was a missionary to the United States from Australia. And he tells this story. He said, when I left Australia years ago, I said to my mother, Mother, if God spares me, I will come back to you. And so for years, she waited. And he recounted, if anyone had said to her, Mrs. Talbot, what are you waiting for? She would have said, for my boy in America, he's coming back. And he said, suppose this person said to her, he's coming back, what, what do you mean? Surely you don't expect a personal, visible, actual coming. She would have absolutely replied, yes, I surely do. That's the way he's coming. It's possible her friend might have said, do you ever get letters from him? Did you ever receive gifts? And sure, yes, of course. The person would have replied, well, that's what he meant. Those things and those things. Figuratively, he has come to you. You've seen little bits of him. L.T. Talbot said, my mother would have quickly answered back, why that isn't what he meant at all. He said he'd be coming back. And it was 37 years later that I stepped off the gangplank of the steamer and said, mother, here I am. You see, that mom was waiting for her son and there were lots of reasons to believe the son was never coming back. And sometimes the goodness of the person who's gone can be mistaken for excusing that they said they were coming back. God's been good to us. And he's prospered this nation. He has prospered us as believers. But make no mistake, Jesus is coming again. Unfortunately, some people spiritualize this passage. In Revelation chapter 1, remember what we saw in verse 7, and it says, There behold, he's coming in the clouds, and every eye will see him. It, we, we see the same thing. Even they who pierced him. You, you, you see, God's been telling the same story for a very, very, very long time. And I would share this with you. If you can't trust God to be true to his word about the second coming, how can you trust him with the words of grace? How can you trust him that we're saved by faith? How can you trust that there even is a heaven if we do not believe that there is a hell that we've been spared from? And so be careful what you spiritualize is my point. A lot of people say, ah, you know, I just don't like thinking about those kind of things. Look, I don't like thinking about it either. And I'm a pastor. But it empowers me. It emboldens me. And it causes me to see people the way I should see them. Not as my enemy, but as someone who needs Jesus. Matthew 24 and verse 27, just prior to the verses we've already read, for as lightning comes from the east and flashes from the west, so also will be the sun coming of the Son of Man. For wherever the carcass is, the eagles will be gathered together and immediately after the tribulation of those days, right after the tribulation is over, is what Jesus said. This isn't John, this isn't Paul, this is Jesus himself. The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. You see, Jesus believed he was coming again. So if Jesus believed he was coming again, remember he said, where I go, I want you to go also, so I'm going to prepare a place for you. He's talking about the church. But he's also going to come back here to take care of everyone and everything else. 
verse 11, this second white horse. And notice what it says, and I saw in heaven, and behold, a white horse. Now remember, we've seen a white horse before, back in chapter 6, verse 2. But there it was very clear that that white horse brought war and the unjust kind of war. The war that took innocent life. And so that was the Antichrist that rode into town. He came imitating Jesus himself. That's what Satan always does. That's what his plan is, is to mimic God himself. Satan, remember, was an angel of light. He's capable of tremendous deception. So much so that Jesus in John's gospel in chapter 8 called him the father of all lies. If there's ever a lie that's been told, it originated in the father of all lies. He is the author, if you will, of lying and of the spirit of it. And so there is going to be deception. There's going to be people, well, you know, that's just figurative. And so the Antichrist will come on the scene, and what follows him will, will, will be death. Chapter 6 to chapter 19 is that story. But notice in our passage tonight, this next writer is called Faithful and True. There's only one who's faithful and true, amen? Not that I am faithful, he is faithful, the Apostle Paul said. Matter of fact, so much so that he is faithful when I am faithless. Amen? So the one who's coming is faithful and true, verse 11 says. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. And so when you look at this faithfulness, Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fashion, hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. I hold fast to the confession of my faith because the guy that promised it is faithful. God. Aren't you glad your salvation doesn't hang on your works? Oh, Jesus, help us if that's the case. And I mean that absolutely respectfully. Jesus, help me. If, if I need his help in grace, can you imagine what we would need if it's works that saves us? He made a promise to redeem us with his own blood, not with your good works. For by the works, Paul said, of righteousness, and we'll study this next in the book of Romans. For by the works of the flesh, no one is justified. You can't make yourself right. But Jesus has made us right. And so this one who's coming back is faithful. Notice the second description, that he is also true. He is the one who's true. He, he's not one who's a, a liar. He, he isn't one who gives you a story one way and then has it come to pass another. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Amen? He's true. Everything about him is true. There's nothing that isn't true. So if he said he's coming back and he comes back as one who is faithful to the promise he made to come back, and what he said is true, and he made the promise to come back, and that promise has to be true. He's faithful and true to both what he said and what he will do with what he said. He's faithful and he is true 100% of the time. He is never unfaithful and he is never untrue. That's in contrast to Allah. Allah actually deceives, did you know that? He's a little crafty. He actually has, the hadith says that he is crafty in the way that he meads out what he says. He's capricious, in other words, is a way to look at it. He kind of gives you what he wants you to believe. And it may not necessarily be true, but he just manipulates you into whatever he wants you to do. Personally, I believe that's why people strap on vests and grab guns and kill innocent people, because they have been craftily convinced that to martyr themselves that way will send them to heaven. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Amen. But it looks like the truth. Christ would never do that. Because he'd have to change his nature to do it. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? You might say that Jesus in that sense is the genuine article. He's the true God. He always has been. 1 John chapter 5, verse 20, 
And, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. He's true. He's always been true. He will always be true. Why is it that Jesus is coming back? You ever thought about that? He's coming back to judge the world. And he's coming back to fight against those that are rebelling against him. That's not a good thing. You see, right now, I always talk to people when they, when they tell me, that, you know, they give me the usual excuses as to why they're engaged in some gross sin. Well, you don't know my family or my life or my, how I grew up or the neighborhood. They give me all the same excuses that everybody gives. We all have them. And I'm not actually even being critical of the people who do those kind of things. I'm simply saying that we have our time right now to make those bad decisions. Can I tell you, you're not going to have the ability to make those bad decisions forever. You're not. God said one day, Jesus Christ himself is coming back and he is faithful and he is true. He's going to enforce his policies on this earth. Right now, we can do whatever we want. Not so forever. And in fact, James chapter 4 verse 1 actually reminds us of the reason... The reason, if you will, that we have war today. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? The reason for every single war that's ever occurred has come from inside of the heart of man. It hasn't been economics it hasn't been government and politics. Those things are, are an expression of the problem. The problem is the hearts of man are deceitfully wicked. Who can know them? God's been patient and he's been long-suffering with mankind's rebellion. And now Jesus is coming to deal with that. Notice verse 12. You see, there's a name and nobody but Jesus knows it. His eyes were like the flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written on that no one knew except himself. I have heard some of the most fanciful explanations for somebody knowing what Scripture says you can't know. Look, it says plainly, nobody's going to know it save Jesus himself. So if you say you know it, let me give you a little clue. You're a false prophet. We don't stone you here. But don't tell somebody you know this name, because you can't know this name. Scripture says so. I take Jesus at his word. Amen. You may think you know it. You may have all kinds of reasons why you know the name. What that makes you is a Gnostic, someone who claims to have special knowledge that nobody else has, that Jesus himself said, you can't have. It's mine. So once he comes back, then we can ask him what the name is. But until then, it's not happening. The Lord sees all things, knows all things. He's going to judge all things. Hebrews 4.13 tells us there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to his eyes, to whom we must one day give an account. And so the Lord is finally going to judge all those secret things, the motivation of every single heart that's left on the face of the earth. Right now the Lord's leaving that open. He's saying, ah, I'm going to let you go. These crowns speak of his authority. And it's interesting because it, it uses the word many. It's myriads. It, it means an untold number. And you can look at it this way. It's as if this, this king is coming back on his great white steed and on his head are so many crowns that it is an innumerable amount saying that he has every bit of authority that's ever been granted ever times a billion. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. But he's going to have a name, and it's going to be something unique. We can guess all day long what it will be, what it might be. But at the end of the day, I leave it where the Lord leaves it. And I believe that was Paul's point there in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Look, we see right now in a mirror dimly. I study and study and st I do all the things necessary. I, I study as hard as I possibly can 
given my limitations and the amount of information that we have in our world, I study. But there are things I don't know. And no matter how long or how hard I study, I will not know them because I cannot know the mind of God. I can know the will of God, but I can't know the mind of God. It's infinite. Mind is finite. For we see in a mirror dimly, Paul said. But then, face to face. That's a very different, it, it's like, you know, you know what you're saying. You know you take a shower in the morning and the mirror's all steamed over. And no matter how much you wipe it, it's still kind of foggy. And you look at yourself and you go, yeah, I look good now. <laughs> but then you walk out and somebody says, you, you know, you got half of the shaving cream still on the other side of your face. It's like all of a sudden, oh, face to face, it's different, huh? It's the same principle. But then I shall know just as I am known. In other words, when I see Jesus face to face, I'm going to be able to know in the same way that he knows. I'm going to have a fully transformed body, and my mind is going to be completely renewed. You're going to have capacities you don't have right now. The next thing that we see is this, this bloody robe and, and, and the word of God. Notice verse 13, and he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. We've seen in our previous studies when we were in chapter 16, we, we know that this incredible battle that's going to be the culmination of the tribulation. It happens at the end. We've named it because of the, the mountain, Har Megiddo. We have called it the Battle of Armageddon. But again, remind yourself that that valley stretches and we're, giving, we're given the places from Edom to Basra. Uh, there we looked at it previously in Isaiah 63. Uh, that is a span of about 184 miles between those two places. It is a huge, it's the entire Jordan Rift Valley, and it includes the Valley of Esherhaddon. It's the Valley of Megiddo. It's the Jezreel Valley. And when you stand on the top of Mount Carmel and look at it, you can just imagine the mass of troops just scattered out. And finally, the Lord returned to judge those who were fighting against him. And I would encourage you to read that passage there in Isaiah 63, just the first six verses. But he comes back, and I want you to see a couple of things. Because the Lord doesn't need our help. Can I remind you of that? He's more than sufficient to fight his battles. We're going to get some more details here in just a few minutes at the end of the chapter. But notice what it does tell us about this one whose robe is dipped in blood. It's very telling. He's called the Word of God. We're told exactly who that is, right? John chapter 1 does not it tell us exactly those words. For in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, not a God as the Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you. The Word was God himself. And then when you skip to verse 14 of John chapter 1, and the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In other words, this one who comes back is none other than Jesus himself, the word of God. Now, can I remind you that Jesus, and we're going to see this in our study in the book of Colossians, as the creator, the preeminent one, spoke the universe into existence. Did he not? God said... Let there be light, and there was light. He didn't grab a bunch of, you know, electrons and neutrons and protons and fashion, you know, helium spherical balls and, and then add hydrogen to them. He didn't, you know, manufacture a star factory and push it out. He just spoke the universe into existence. So I can tell you when he comes back the second time, he can speak out of existence the armies of the world very easily. And so he simply speaks. The word comes forth out of his mouth. And notice verse 14. The armies of heaven join in with them. Here we come. This is where you get to get all fired up. Because you're coming back with him. You've been at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen? 
Because you chose to believe and receive the gift of grace, you've been in heaven celebrating with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that final stage uh, of, of the Hebrew wedding, the Jewish wedding has taken place. You went through the betrothal, the ceremony has come, the bridegroom has snatched away his bride, they have run to the wedding, they are now underneath the hoopah, they go to the feast, and now that whole wedding party, the host of heavens, is coming back to what's rightfully theirs. Because this earth belongs to Jesus. It doesn't belong to the enemy. He's been allowed long enough to have reign on this earth, but he doesn't get to keep it. And the Lord Jesus is going to return in the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Can you imagine being at a feast and coming out completely unstained? It's like super Teflon on our gowns. I don't know. But we're going to be just chowing down and praising God and singing the, the hallelujah chorus at the top of our lungs, and then we're going to mount up. I don't know how many of you have ever been to Vienna. Connie and I, when we were living in Austria, we got a chance to go to Vienna to the Spanish riding school, and, and the home of the Lipizzaners, but these, these stallions that can dance. I don't know what it's going to be like riding back with Jesus, but it's going to be better than that. You're coming with them. When I, when I talk about this passage with guys, they're kind of like, oh, well. But usually the ladies are like, yes, I always wanted a white horse, you know. <laughs> You're coming back with them as the armies of heaven. We've been home since the rapture. We've just finished up the marriage supper of the Lamb. We get on those horses and head back to the earth. And I want to tell you, this is, this is not a New Testament idea. It actually comes from the story of Enoch. It's recorded in Jude, Jude verses 14 and 15. And it says there, and now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, the seventh person from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with tens of thousands of his saints. Enoch said that. He said that the Lord would come back. To execute, notice what he says, this is Jude recording the words of Enoch. To execute judgment, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they've committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. That's a description of the saints returning from heaven with Jesus to take care of biz. To finally do what God's always said he's going to do. And can I remind you, but the Lord doesn't need our help. Psalm 2 reminds us that the nations of the world have gathered against the Lord, of course. But God only needs his word to defeat them. He'll just speak it and it will be so. Verses 14 through 16, 15 through 16, excuse me, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. Remember that he is the sword. He is the word of God. And with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them. Notice with a rod of iron. There will be a period of forced righteousness, and we'll look at this as we get to the millennial reign a little bit closer. But he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. In other words, he himself is going to do these things. That's why his garments are dipped in blood. The Lord is going to take care of it himself. People have asked me, well, why would he do that? I, I think there's one chief reason that comes to mind when I think of this passage. Number one, we have not been appointed to wrath, and so for us to express the wrath of God wouldn't even be acceptable. We have no capacity to have God's wrath whatsoever. When we talk about righteous indignation, it's still tainted by our sin nature. And even though we're coming from heaven, there is still a righteousness that belongs to God that is God alone. And so when he comes back, he's going to take care of this because he's the only one qualified to take care of it. And he has on his robe and on his thigh the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen? Amen. When you think about it, how foolish can you be to fight against God? I mean, seriously. 
How foolish can you be? I mean, God simply spoke to Satan and he fled, didn't he? Satan himself. And here's the armies of mankind arrayed in this battle array, coming against Jerusalem, ultimately to fight in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, which is at the confluence of the Hinnom and the Kidron Valley in Jerusalem. And so they're all pressing in like they're going to they're gonna wipe out the remainder of the Jewish people. It's going to be insane. But they will do it. Isaiah 11 and verse 4 tells us this. It says, But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. You, you see, I believe that the Lord will simply speak, and it will be so. And people, you know, they'll, well, we're, you know, we're making these sound weapons, and, you know, maybe that's what, I, No. Look, if the Lord can speak the universe into existence, he can surely speak out of existence some armies. Amen? How he does that, I, I don't actually need, nor do I want a description. I actually don't want to see it happen. But he will do it. He will then rule with a rod of iron. And, and I believe, because the, the staff that's mentioned here, the rod is the shepherd's staff. And so it seems to indicate that the Lord then, once he does this thing, once he takes care of the armies of the world and those who fight against him, then he is going to rule the rest of them with the rod of iron. If you've ever watched a shepherd, um, they're not exactly nice to sheep. I mean, sheep are kind of hard-headed. And so they get whacked and pushed and prodded and hooked and drugged and knocked down. All kinds of things happen. But it's so that they'll stay in the sheepfold. They'll stay with the shepherd. And so the Lord Jesus will then move to, to put down rebellion. It won't be tolerated. Lawlessness absolutely is going to be dealt with immediately, as soon as it happens. Righteousness will then fill the land. And embroidered on his robe and on his thigh as king of kings and lord of lords. Have you ever wondered why Philippians 2 says what it says? This is the reason. This is the chief part of the reason. It says there in verse 5, Philippians 2, we looked at it some months ago. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being the very form God, didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of bond servant, coming in the likeness of men. You see, the first time he came in the likeness of men. The first time he came in the likeness of men. Humble, meek, hungry, did without being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Verse 9, therefore. That's the breaking point. The whole humility thing was necessary. God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. There isn't another King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There's one King of Kings, one Lord of Lords. Jesus has that name. He's the only one that's got that name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, those in heaven, those on earth, and even those who have already departed this earth and are under it. You see, one day, whether you believe that Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord or not, you're going to bow the knee to Jesus because he is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen? That's how he's coming back. He's coming back in glory and splendor. He's not going to be riding a donkey into Jerusalem next time. He's going to put his feet down on the Mount of Olives and split it in two. He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So you can bow now. We can bow now in humility. In essence, we can choose our own dinner reservations. Amen? Now, I, don't know, I, I don't know how many of you use the Open Table app, but I like that app. You know, you can sit there, you pull out your smartphone, and I want to go to Buca de Beppo, and I plug my thing in there, and I put a uh, party of five, and I want to be at seven, and it tells me that's two weeks from now you can get in. And I go, that's not going to work. I'll go 7.30, and... 
And I choose my reservation and I hit yes, accept, and they send me a nice email. It says, you're, thank you, Mr. Gill, and your reservations are at 7.30 and you just come. And, and all the people that show up at the door, they're going, how did he get in? That's because I made reservations. You can make your reservations. You can choose to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb or you have, by not choosing, made reservations at the Feast of the Buzzards. You get to choose your own reservations. You're making your reservations with the choices you make in this life. You're pulling out your heavenly smartphone saying, no, I really don't want to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'll just wait for a table. All brothers and sisters, don't wait for the table. Because the tables that are going to be left on this earth, you're not, going to be want, you're not going to want to be at those tables. And then I saw an angel, verse 17 says, standing on the sun. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying that all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven come and gather together from the supper of the great God. Notice this is a different supper. This is not the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is the supper of the great God, and here's how we know it's different. That you may eat of the flesh of kings, of the captains, the flesh of the mighty men, the flesh of the horses, and those who sit on them, the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. As I said, you can choose to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb, or you will be supper at the great supper. You make your own reservations. Here's the awesome thing. There's infinite room at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen? Amen. For all who will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen? So if you're here tonight and you haven't made reservations for the marriage supper of the Lamb, I'm going to encourage you to make those reservations tonight. You see, it's not a pretty picture. It's not intended to be a pretty picture. It's intended to be a horrible picture. Verse 19 says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth. And I love this because you know what? I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking forward to the day when the, when the devil gets his. Amen? I don't know about you. I've seen enough people go the wrong way. I'm looking forward to him getting, I'm going to be selling popcorn. I'll, I'll be the guy, I'm just going to get, you know, I like popcorn. I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And then the beast was captured. Yeah, amen. The beast was captured. And Jesus isn't going to have to do much to do it. Let me tell you that. And with him the false prophet. Hallelujah. So the whole system. Remember, there's a false religious system, a false governmental system, and a false monetary system. And these guys have been running it. And Jesus comes back, first breathes the army out of existence, and then said, oh, by the way, you two, right there. Follow me. Who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. And these two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Amen. That's where they're going. Man has assembled his forces. God is greater than all those forces. Joel chapter 1 tells us how long this battle will last. I love this. Joel 1, 15. Alas for the day. For the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. In other words, it might not even last a day. The world's armies have been arrayed against Jesus, and he just says, nah. Sorry, but no. You're done. And then we find, closing tonight, the fate of the unholy trinity. This incredible picture. You, you see what happens to them as they're thrown alive in a lake of burning sulfur. These two beasts, the Antichrist, the false prophet, we met them back chapter, chapter 13. And finally, they get their due. They're, they're thrown where they belong. They're cast into the bottomless pit. 
You, you see, Satan's fate at this time is going to be different, and we, we know that because of what's coming in chapter 20. These two guys go straight where they belong, the lake of burning with fire. It's a final place of torment. It's after Hades. And, and so this, this abiding place of the dead, which right now is occupied with anyone who's ever died that did not know Jesus, and they are awaiting the great white throne judgment, where they will be finally judged. It's not as bad as it's going to get for them. It gets worse. The Antichrist, the false prophet, but Satan is going to be released. We're going to see that. He'll instigate one last war in chapter 20. And why God does that, I believe, is fairly clear. We'll cover that next time. There's going to be people that will be born during this period of time. They will have had parents that did not go to heaven. They will have been here through the tribulation. They will still be able to have children. And they will have lived a thousand years. But see this incredible scene as God comes back and does what we're hoping he'd do tonight, quite frankly. In spite of all that, the Antichrist, the false prophet, are going to be the first to experience Gehenna. And then the, the enemy of our soul, Satan himself, a thousand years later after God releases him one time from this, this holding place before he judges everyone finally. After that time, there won't be any more evil. It'll be done. Then Satan will join them. But I want to close with just a couple of thoughts. And they're important thoughts. Because the choice really is yours. During these things that we've seen going on, millions at least, perhaps billions of people are going to perish. And as horrible as that sounds, God said so. There is not a single reason in this universe for us to not believe what God has plainly stated. You want to spiritualize it? That's on you. But I believe God said what he meant, meant what he said. Verse 21 says, And the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and the birds were filled with all their flesh. You see, the choice is yours. The choice is mine. It's always been that way. And when you turn your attention to your Bibles and you begin to study it, you begin to look through what Scripture says, people may mock you for believing that the Lord's coming again. They probably will. Let me just be honest with you. When you tell people that you believe Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth again, literally, they're going to look at you like there are screws loose. Loco in la cabeza. <laughs> Two S, muy loco. <laughs> Yeah, they're going to think all kinds of crazy things about you. That's okay. I'd rather be a fool for Jesus while I'm here than be proven a fool when I leave. Amen? Amen. They're going to mock you. But God's never been wrong. That's why Titus is told by the Apostle Paul there in Titus 2, look for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and King. Amen? He wasn't just kind of, well, you know, maybe someday. He was giving him an absolute. He's saying, look, look for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and King. That was 2,000 years ago. How much closer do you think the Lord Jesus is to returning tonight? A lot closer. Infinitely closer. The population of the world at the time these words were written was less than a billion people. It's pushing 7 billion now. And it's growing more wicked by the day. I don't know how much time we have. But we need to be looking for his return. Both the Old and the New Testaments absolutely filled with promises of the second coming of the Lord. There are 1,845 references in the Old Testament, a total of 17 Old Testament books given preeminence to the second coming of the Lord. That's a lot of speaking about something that ain't going to happen. Of the 260 chapters in your entire New Testament, there are 318 references to the second coming. 318 of them. 23 of the 27 New Testament books speak of the second coming of the Lord. 
one out of every 30 verses in the entire New Testament talks about the second coming of the Lord in some way, shape, or form when you just average them. Jesus is coming again. For every prophecy of the first coming, there are eight of the second coming. Jesus is coming again. Leave you with this and we'll pray. Some time ago in a family argument over the authority of the Bible, the reality of hell, an aging grandfather brought forward his strong argument that the Bible was just a book of stories. And he said this, he said, I'm 70 years old and I have never met anybody that's been there and I have never seen such a place as hell. And after everything that the Bible has to say about it, if I haven't seen it, I don't believe it exists. If Jesus is real, then he's a liar because he talked more about hell than anybody else in the entire Bible. His grandson, who was seven, was listening to the whole exchange. And he said, Granddaddy, have you ever been dead yet? <laughs> you don't get to see the reality of hell until you leave this life. Not a good thing to guess at. If Jesus spent that much time talking about the reality of it, it's a real place. And furthermore, he didn't create it for people. He created it for Satan and his angels. Scripture plainly says that. So I'm going to ask you to stand. Have the worship team come back out. Ask some of the pastors to come forward. And again, I just want to give an opportunity, and so I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, bow your heads. I'm going to ask some help from the guys in the back because it's a little dark in here. And if you've been listening and, and you've not made your dinner reservations yet for the marriage supper of the Lamb, and you want to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. I'd love to pray with you tonight. So if that's you and you're here tonight, I'm just going to ask you to quietly slip your hand up in the air high enough that we can see it. If there's anybody here, we'll pray for you. I see that hand in the back. I see that hand over there as well. Don't be embarrassed because Jesus loves you. I can tell you that. And he came to this earth to die for you. Anybody else? All right. Believers, you can pray silently. If you've raised your hand, would you just pray after me? Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. I believe that heaven is real and that hell is real. And that you came to save me from the reality of eternal damnation. I invite you into my life. I invite you to take over and be Lord. I would ask that you would forgive me of my sin, that you'd write my name in the Lamb's book of life. I promise to walk with you all the rest of my days, give you the control that you need to help me do that. I ask these things in the blessed name of Jesus, my Savior. Amen. Amen and amen. Welcome to the family of God.